Hi, my name is Jonathan Murray, Creative Director of Unoya. Hello, this is Jessica Blass, the art lead for Unoya. My name is James Davis, and I am the producer for Unoya. In this documentary, my team members and I will take you on a behind-the-scenes journey of Unoya, breaking things down from concept to final release, covering what worked, what didn't, our toughest challenges, and how we surmounted them. We hope you enjoy. Yanoi was one of two games selected through an elimination process, where each student would submit a high concept of a game idea, and through voting faces and pitches, the games would be curated to a final selection for chosen leadership to decide which games they would represent and would be worked on for the next nine months. During the elimination process, leadership and brand presentations were held for students to show off their skills and to aid in the professor deciding who would be the best fit for the roles of producer and creative director. I felt like the squirrel from Hoodwinked giving the leadership presentation, honestly. I wanted the role though because it's my goal to lead production teams and to make great games and this was my first shot to do just that. I knew it would be a lot of work, but I was up for it. I was apprehensive about putting my hat into the ring for leadership. I have never seen myself as a leader and figured I would be better off as potentially an artist or art lead due to my rapidly accelerating fanaticism with the industry. Little did I know at this time that my life would quickly undergo a drastic evolution that semester due to mentorship and research for other courses. However, I was concerned about Game Design Workshop, a two-semester project, becoming a horror story I experienced in a past project course. So I decided that I could potentially prevent that from happening if I became a leader. Many lessons would inevitably be learned, full of would-haves or could-haves, but looking back I felt it was a necessary experience and I was a net benefit. For our section, there would end up being two of each, and the pairs, combined with the chosen game's respective vision holder, would lead to the formation of Yanoya by, at the time, Zenith Studios, and Ephotic Descent by Broiled Squid Studios. However, the games could not be created without a team. Drafts were held for team leads to form the rest of their team from the remaining class body. When Unoya was originally pitched, I fell in love with Jack's concept of storytelling through color. I put my hat in the ring for art lead because I wanted to create a visually simplistic but beautiful game. While I've managed team projects in the past, I've never done so for such a large game project and thought that this experience would be great for my resume. Utilizing the ideas from game pitches and iterative discussion with the newly formed teams, it was time to begin production and working towards the art and design prototypes. Sprint 1 was about discovery, putting together the minds of our code and design departments to figure out what our core mechanics would be. On the other side, the art department would be concepting and building some of the central assets for the game engine, and by extension figuring out what the art style would end up being and showcasing them within the art prototype. This entire first sprint was coming up with our art style. We decided on a cartoony low poly game with more vibrant colors and cell shading. Together, we developed the groundwork for the art style guide and started working on the initial concept art for the levels. During this time, Unoy's narrative lead and vision holder, Jack Galassi, and I would meet with my sister, a licensed clinical psychologist, to discuss how to best go about portraying and handling the game's central themes, a journey of grief and its five stages. Out of this, we focused a lot on universal color meanings for the design of the game world and abilities, as well as making the core levels of the game, themed respectively around anger, bargaining, and depression, playable in any order to reflect how an individual's journey can be so different but similar to another's. Unfortunately, during this time, Hurricane Ian threw a wrench into our work and plans by temporarily disabling the ability for some of our team members to work. However, by still being able to communicate and the camaraderie of the team as a whole, we saw things through to fruition. We were fortunate to be able to work through Hurricane Ian and only suffer minor setbacks. Our hearts go out to those who weren't as lucky and suffered great loss. We wish you well. Our next sprint started to take all the ideas previously laid out and bring them together in a single prototype for what would eventually become our vertical slice. Our core mechanics were fully outlined and undergoing polishing after their prototype. Pulse, our red-themed ability, was inspired by controlled breathing. Crystal, our green-themed clone ability, was inspired by support networks, and Tether, our blue-themed grapple ability, 
was inspired by staying anchored to reality and pulling yourself onwards and upwards. We also explored potential additions and alterations to our core mechanics, such as a muted and restored version. However, these would end up being downscoped and cut as vision and direction of the game changed over time. The art department began to work on texturing many of the core assets, such as a player model, ability, VFX, and particles, and environmental pieces for our vertical slice level, which would be an example of our game's first level, themed around denial. To keep the world a consistent scale, we decided early on to use Iris, our main character, as the unit of measurement that all other models would be based on. Because of that, we prioritized getting her model done as quickly as possible. The Iris model seen in most of our build demos was the first version, which later got a full facelift and a new hairdo. I spent a lot of these first two sprints figuring out the strengths and weaknesses of my artists, which made the art pipeline and task assignments so much smoother in later sprints. Sprint 3 was where it started to become a question of how feasible the scope of the project was. Throughout the sprint, the two sets of mechanics originally planned were becoming overwhelming to incorporate, and trying to implement two of the five levels for Vertical Slice seemed impossible to do without creating more issues with the project. So I made the decision to cut the second level demo and redirect the designers to focus on creating the best version of Denial that we could. I believe it was the best decision we could have made because of how the level ended up coming out. Indeed, and we'd soon see just how much work lay ahead of us when our first rounds of playtesting feedback from other project teams would come. The rest of Sprint 3 would see the wrapping up for that first playable build, getting sketches of cutscenes, menus, animations, sound and music, the works, all despite yet another hurricane striking. With the end of the semester and the final build of our Vertical Slice approaching, feedback from other teams had us backtracking on some of our more expansive plans to polish animations and game mechanics, timings on sound effects, VFX and particles, camera movement and consistency became paramount. We began to see just how much went into a truly polished experience. Yeah, a lot of our assets and animations got cut from the vertical slice due to time constraints and the downsize of the level scope. However, the design team was able to incorporate some of the models from the levels that got cut into this version of Denial, and they looked amazing with the post-processing. This was the first time we saw the models implemented, and it proved that our art style could work cohesively. There was a lot of work to be done, and the feedback only solidified that the decision to cut from two levels to one for the vertical slice was the best choice. Despite the setbacks we had faced in iterations as well as revisions that we underwent, vertical slice ended up being a point of pride for the team as a whole. It was a gratifying experience in a number of ways to see something that was previously only just an idea become something that you can actually engage with. Once the final pieces were in, it was like everything had finally fallen into place. The game worked and looked stunning. With some sleepless nights and the overall dedication the team had for getting things done, the build was released and we anxiously awaited the feedback that would come over winter break. Having to cut back on what we included for denial in our vertical slice made us very aware of the road that lay ahead if we were to meet our goals of five levels, one for each stage of grief. Coming back to a new semester brought many new ideas with it, and concerns. I myself even felt as though I may step down from the role as creative director. However, many members of the team had looked up to me due to the workshops I held and documentation I wrote or other resources provided to better equip them to perform their tasks from knowledge I had accumulated through personal research and projects. Stepping down would mean a hard hit to team morale, and I decided that I could not stand idly by when I knew that I could be a deciding factor. I returned in full force to see the game to its culmination and ensure it would be a mark of pride for all that were a part of it, as well as continuing to support the growth and development of the team. Sprint 5 was like starting all over from scratch. We knew what we wanted to accomplish and we knew what we could accomplish, but the question still remained of if it could be accomplished to the scale we were setting ourselves up to. Questioning if we would have a creative director by the end of the sprint was already a scary thought but also trying to re-establish workflows, pipelines, and communication again after nearly a month off was a struggle. Undoubtedly, cross-department communication had led to a lot of unnecessary delays and crunch in the project as a whole, 
which only fanned the flames of tension in trying to overcome the pile of work that lay ahead for implementing all levels and addressing feedback for the continual polishing of both player and eventual level mechanics. With a 19-person team and only a few small people capable of specific tasks, finding a pipeline that allowed for a consistent progression of work was a constantly evolving process. Starting to have more cross-department discussions outside of our typical twice-weekly scrum meetings for open discussion across the whole team and creating sub-departments that involved members of multiple departments such as a UI team with a dedicated artist, designer, and programmer facilitated more interpersonal communication rather than just between workers and leadership. It became something of an initial stepping stones towards a better process. Communication as a whole was rough coming off of winter break. In order to get back on track, weekly check-ins were established as a way to share what was being worked on, get feedback on assets, and help each other solve issues. I also started sending out a list of goals at the beginning of every week. That way, everyone was on the same page for what needed to get done. Furthermore, I worked with the design department lead, Nikolai, to get asset lists created for each level. A lot of the struggle we had at the beginning was due to us making assets that the designers didn't end up using, and the new asset list told us exactly what the designers were planning and what they needed, which prevented any more time from being wasted. Sprint 6 was go time. We had a lot of good ideas, but now was when construction needed to happen or we wouldn't have all five levels like we planned for. Design delivered some great white boxes at the end of Sprint 5, but unfortunately, I had to cut bargaining. Again. Just like the vertical slice. It hurt that I had to do it again, but it was the needed thing to do. It needed more work and more work it got, and I honestly think that it became our best level, visually and mechanically. It was. Sprint 6 also saw the implementation of a new helper system to give hints and narrative through the game, as well as music and animations for secondary NPCs in the budding core levels. We had also gone through many more phases, even with Sprint 5, in regards to further polishing the grapple mechanic and the UI symbol cooldown effects and placement. The pulse mechanic even got a shield addition to it, but that was quickly phased out due to how level changes had to happen again. We also realized that a lot of blockages were being caused by us not working in Unity's URP system, and we made a migration from built-in to URP. Thankfully, little issues were caused besides having to fix some materials. During this time, we also rebranded to Prismatic Studios, finding it to be more fitting for the project as a whole, as Zenith was an aspiration, but Prismatic was our heart. The shift to URP caused some concerns at first. Seeing all the assets we worked so hard to create turn blue and pink was very alarming, but it all worked out. The sprint was also the dawn of the beaver house, which technically started last sprint but was now being implemented in the game. This was one of the ideas brought up by Kelly that sparked so much excitement and creativity in the artists. Sprint 7 was where a lot of the team was starting to feel burnt out. While trying to figure out how to move through it and keep everything on track, my dad was diagnosed with cancer. Facing this struggle, I realized grief isn't just something experienced when losing something or someone. It also happens when faced with the reality that it will happen, and nothing can stop it from happening. Even if it was temporary, stepping away was not an easy decision for me. With the team being very compartmentalized by this point, team leaders handling the tasking for their departments and also helping to facilitate communication and updates between departments, we were able to adjust to give you the time and space needed while keeping up progress. All primary assets were effectively complete by this point, turning the art team to focus on polishing older assets or making whatever was deemed additionally necessary by design for props. The 2D side started to work on transitionary cutscenes for each level as well as going through the process to finalize the main beginning and end. All core levels were finally in, but with only a couple sprints remaining, very little was done in the way of acceptance, and there was no way we were going to have a game about grief without it. Mountains were going to have to be moved, and with the tides of progression and regression in aspects of the game as feedback continued to come in sprint by sprint, the game itself started to feel like an allegory of grief in game design. 
Yeah, major props to Ricky and Kelly for all the 2D animation work. Creating 8 hand-drawn animations for this game was a monumental task, and I am so astonished and blown away by how incredible they turned out. This was also the sprint where character animations and particles finally got implemented. Those were a really long time coming, and I was so excited during the weekly build presentation to see Iris do her little pulse jump. Sprint 8 through postmortem and scrum conversations, we had a revitalization across the team. A call to dig in for the home stretch, like a competition and race, was heard loud and clear. The art department was cleaving through cutscenes and animations, as well as overhauling some of the UI icons and helping to integrate skyboxes to the levels. Design had done beautifully with finishing set dressing the core levels, with assets and terrain systems, and finally acceptance had a plan in action. Music for all levels and an abundance of sound effects as well as UI functionality was polished off. Code saw all of this through, from ideation to integration, and game systems such as saving and the camera were enhanced. Something that I wanted to point out was how creative the design team was with the level set dressing. The majority of the models were made with a specific level in mind, and so seeing some of the models be used and incorporated in other levels besides their intended ones was a very nice touch. It really helped to make the game more cohesive, which was something we were concerned about since the levels were so thematically different from one another. It also led to some humorous moments like seeing the sake barrels from the shipwreck and depression show up all over the beaver house in anger. With so much flammable alcohol and a burning building, no wonder the beavers were panicking. It can always be a struggle to create uniformity across a game when the environments look and feel as drastically different as the emotions of grief are. The little details of sharing assets across the levels started to create that cohesiveness we really needed. Sprint 9 was the shortest, just about a week and a half to adjust the game before the final presentation and showcase. It was a race against the clock to polish, playtest, and hunt to squash every bug and null reference possible. Marketing material such as our site imagery and the Yanoya poster were made and printed, and acceptance was finally reaching a serviceable point. All the cutscenes were finished, post-processing and final lighting implementation, as well as some juicy final particle systems, brought a new level of enhancement to the game as a whole. It felt like vertical slice all over again. Everyone was already working so hard and kicked it into overdrive and everything started coming together. The lighting, the post-processing, the final touches took the game from looking good enough to being gorgeous and even more so than what we had in Vertical Slice. It was unbelievably satisfying to see the reactions to our presentation and our showcase, to hear people enjoyed playing and loved the message and imagery and music of the game. As the final chapter came to a close, all the invested effort, time, and energy was paid off in full, and the project cemented itself as a milestone in the hearts and minds of the team. Sure, it's not to say that things were perfect in the end, perfection after all is an illusion, there is always going to be that last little bug or potential alteration you can make, but that's just it, the journey never ends. And with the closing of a project you can finally look back on all that you accomplished and take it in stride to new horizons. And so too does it mean that this video also comes to an end. We, the developers of Prismatic Studios, want to say thank you for watching, and thanks to everyone that was a part of Yanoi's journey. If you would like to play Yanoi for yourself, you can find the game on our Itch page and soon on Steam for free. We hope you learned something, and enjoyed. This project was by far the highlight of my educational career. I learned and experienced so much over the course of these last nine months. So much more than I had in the previous three years as a game design student, and that was all thanks to my team. It was an absolute honor to work alongside so many talented artists, coders, and designers. I'm so proud of the work we'd created together. Thank you so much for putting your faith in me as an art lead, and I will always remember and cherish this experience. I am so proud of the team. Everyone involved in creating Yanoya should take pride in this moment. The road was not easy, but nothing worthwhile is easy to do. Own your accomplishments and go to the next journey with your head high. You deserve it.